everybody. Once again, I'm happy that you chose to join us for our Mount Sinai MBC of Memphis YouTube channel. Let us pray. Most holy and gracious Father, we thank you for bringing us together virtually to study your word. We ask as always that you would open our hearts and minds to receive your fresh. In Jesus' name, amen. So we are still on article number 13, a gospel church. And our author writes, we believe that a visible church of Christ is a congregation of baptized believers associated by covenant in the faith and fellowship of the gospel, observing the ordinances of Christ governed by his laws and exercising the gifts, rights, and privileges invested in them by his word, that it's only scriptural officers are bishops, pastors, and deacons whose qualifications claims and duties are defined in the epistle to Timothy and Titus. Our scripture from Acts, the second chapter, verses 41 and 42, and this is the King James Version. It says, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there was added unto them about 3,000 souls, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers. So the church of Christ had its beginning on the day of Pentecost. The prophet Joel in 2.28 says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. And Jesus in John 16 verses 5 through 15 says, in essence, that he will send another counselor, the spirit of truth. So the day of Pentecost was the fulfillment of these two promises. It was a spectacular and amazing day, purely orchestrated by God. First, there was a violent wind that filled the house. In the Bible, breath or wind is a symbol of the Spirit of God. Remember the story of the dry bones in Ezekiel 37? Ezekiel's vision of the valley of dry bones after inspection he concluded that they were very dry. But when the breath of God enters them, they come to life and stand on their feet, which is a demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit to bring life to dead situations. This same Holy Spirit is still bringing life to not only dead situations, but to our dry bodies of faith. Then there were cloven tongues, like as of fire, that separated and came and rest on each of the disciples. Hebrew 12, 29 says that our God is a consuming fire. Fire in the Bible is often symbolic of the presence of God. God made his presence known to Moses through fire. A bush was burning, but it was not consumed. God's presence was known to the children of Israel by a pillar of fire that guided them. Fire is also used as a picture of the work of the Holy Spirit. He is the presence of God as he dwells in the heart of all believers. In the Old Testament, the Lord showed his presence to the Israelites by filling the tabernacle with fire. But in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit guides and comforts the people of God by dwelling in them as the tabernacle. The Bible says that as believers, we are the temple of the living God. The Holy Spirit creates a passion for the Lord in the hearts of his people that can be described as a burning within. Remember the two disciples on the road to Emmaus when Jesus appeared and talked to them and after their eyes were open and they knew him, he vanished from their sight. But then in Luke 24 and 32, they said to one another, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road and while he opened the scripture to us? The burning was so great that the Bible says that they got up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem. Now, y'all, that was about seven miles, and it was dark. Now, I don't know how they felt about seven miles. To them, it might have been a short distance since their main mode of transportation was walking. But to me, seven miles is seven miles, no matter how you look at it. They 
were empowered by the Holy Spirit. They had a burning that probably made the seven miles seem like one or two blocks. It, it, it could happen. Remember Jacob who worked seven years to marry Rachel? And the Bible says that he was so much in love with her that the seven years seemed only as a few days. So after the apostles received the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, they had a passion for the Lord that lasted a lifetime. It didn't, it, it, it never burned out. They were transformed from fear to fearless, and they were compelled to speak the word boldly wherever the Holy Spirit led them. The same is true for believers today. The Holy Spirit will transform our lives. He will live in us and empower us to do the work that we have been set apart to do. Just as a silversmith uses fire to remove the junk from precious metal, the Lord uses the Holy Spirit to purge us of the sin that dwells in us. He aims to purify us. The presence of the Holy Spirit was also manifested on the day of Pentecost in the speaking of other tongues or more specific other languages. At that time in, Ho in Jerusalem, there were Jews from every nation under heaven and they all spoke different languages. At one time, everybody spoke the same language until the people out of pride decided that they would make a name for themselves and instead of uh, replenishing the earth, they decided they would stay in one place. Uh, you remember after the flood, God told them to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, which means be mobile. And, and so God put a stop to their plan for greatness by confusing their language. Genesis, the 11th chapter, verses 7 through 9, and this is the NIV, it says, Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth and they stopped building the city. That is why it was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. But at Pentecost, the miracle of them speaking in other languages enabled the people that were outside of Judea to hear the message of the gospel. They were, this was an amazing, an amazing phenomenon. So much so that they were accused, they accused the disciples of being drunk with new wine. Now how ridiculous is that? That that tells me that people will say anything, no matter how ridiculous it sounds, rather than believe in the gospel. What kind of wine, new or old, will cause you to speak in a language that is understood by folk in different countries? Now, I've heard drunk folk talk, and the language they speak would never be described as intelligent. That day, the Holy Spirit brought thousands of people together to hear the gospel. Then Peter and the 11 disciples stood up. Peter raised his voice to, in essence, denounce the notion that they were drunk. And he said, he said, it's too early in the day for that. Then he began to preach. This even though know, this is a comical story, it, it kind of reminds me uh, of a thing that my previous pastor uh, told us about his pastor. He said that if somebody else was up to preach that, that Sunday and his pastor looked out and saw a large crowd, he would tell the brother that was supposed to preach that the folk had come to hear him, so he would preach instead of letting the guy preach. Of course, that's not what happened with Peter. The Holy Spirit moved on him to preach, and preach he did. This was the first sermon of the church preached after Pentecost, and the Holy Spirit moved in a great way, a magnificent way. Acts 2 and 37 NIV says, When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the uh, other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? They were convicted by the Holy Spirit through the preaching of the gospel. Conviction is an emotional movement of the heart. 
the person's heart is touched and moved to some degree of brokenness. It's being pricked with a tug, a pull, a, a knowledge and awareness of one's sinful state of coming short and disappointing God. While at the same time needing more and more of him and his righteousness. Conviction causes one to seek answers and to ask the question, what must I do? And Peter gave the answer in verse 38. It says, Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Then verse 40 says, with many other words, he warned them, and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. And then that brings us to our verses which says, verse 41, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Note that the first church was made up of people that gladly received the word. Not everybody that was there received the word. Some were too busy finding fault, and some were just closed-minded. But can you imagine the euphoria of that day? 3,000 souls that gladly received the word. Can you imagine the fellowship, the shouting, the dancing, the singing? This would be described as a truly Holy Ghost good time. Can you imagine the time it took to baptize 3,000 believing souls? And finally, verse 42 says, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. They didn't get baptized and say, I got mine, now you get yours, and, and went about their business. They continued steadfastly, which means that they persevered, they persisted, they didn't quit, nor did they slip back. They didn't allow any little thing to keep them from meeting together. They continued steadfastly in four things. In the doctrine, which is the teaching and instructions of the apostles, which would be the same teaching of Christ. They continued steadfastly in fellowship. They didn't practice being a lone ranger Christian. Whenever you decide that you don't want to fellowship with other believers, just know that all the reasons you give yourself is from Satan and not from the Holy Spirit. They continued steadfastly in the breaking of bread or in the Lord's Supper. They set aside time to observe and remember the Lord's death. And finally, they continued steadfastly in prayer. Prayer is the glue. Through prayer, they were brought into a more intimate fellowship with each other and in the presence of God. James 4 and 8 says that when we draw near to God, he will draw near to us. And then Psalms 145 verse 18 says, The Lord is nigh unto all them that call upon him, to all that call upon him in truth. And finally, Psalm 73 verse 28 says, But it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all thy works. And so I'll end this lesson with the, with the question, how's your prayer life? Come back next week as we continue our study of the gospel church. Until then, be safe, be blessed, and take care. See ya.